Welcome back, everyone. Other than digitalization, another hot topic in the maritime industry is decarbonization. And that was also covered yesterday on the first day of Singapore Norway Innovation Conference. One major initiative in the Singapore Maritime Decarbonization Drive is in the setting up of the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization to spearhead the maritime industry's energy transition journey. The center aims to collaborate with the industry to help the maritime sector reduce greenhouse gas emissions, implement identified decarbonization pathways, and create new business opportunities. To deliver the keynote on decarbonization with a focus on solutions for bunkering of alternative fuel, we have specially invited Dr. Sanjay Kutan, who is the, currently the Chief Technology Officer of the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization. Prior to his uh, this appointment, he has served almost three years as Executive Director of the Singapore Maritime Institute. Since 1994, he has worked in both the private and public sector. Sanjay, please. Thank you for that, uh, Daniel, and uh, very good afternoon and evening to everyone and for hanging on in this late part of the day. It's a credit to all of you. Uh, Dan, I presume you're controlling my slides. Yeah, so yes. can I go to the next slide, please? I uh, just wanted to uh, share with you the mission statement for the Global Center of Maritime uh, Decarbonization as GCMD is really to help the maritime industry eliminate GHG emissions by shaping standards, deploying solutions, financing projects, and fostering collaboration across the sectors. These words were actually uh, chosen uh, purposefully, uh, and we center our activities around each of the highlighted uh, words there, shaping, deploying, financing, and fostering. And uh, that's our main focus. Uh, the center was set up on the 1st of August this year. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and one of the main challenges is to really to identify where those gaps are that is preventing the, uh, the scaling, uh, the adoption and scaling of decarbonized solutions. If I have the next slide, please. This is the main slide of today's topic. And it's gonna be more apparent than when we begin to look at alternative fuels. It cannot be done by any one part of the ecosystem. It would require uh, all stakeholders along the supply chain to come together and work together to achieve uh, safe and efficient operations of, uh, of the bunkering operations. And I just want to start right from the top, uh, as you see uh, the government and funding stakeholders. This group is important because this group sets the tone. It's, it sets the ambition and it sets the courage for each one of the stakeholders along the supply chain to move forward in a direction that would adopt alternative fuels. And the next block on regulatory and safety authorities. We need to understand that a lot of the fuels, while uh, they've been talked about, and this includes uh, from the range from biofuels to ammonia to hydrogen uh, 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 and the likes, a lot of them are already uh, moved around as commodities. Uh, and these molecules have existed since time immemorial for most. But when it comes to bunkering, it's a very different scenario. There's, first of all, multiple handshakes by different groups of people in moving the molecule all the way from the production plant all into the vessel. And each handshake has a very different operating condition. And therefore, if we are using fuel that has either high flammability or high toxicity, we need to really understand the operating and safety envelopes that allows the safe passage of this molecule, not only to the workers around the activity, but the environment in itself. And this is where the regulatory and safety authorities come into play because their interest is a fiduciary interest to protect the communities that they operate under. So therefore getting them on board with a fact-based uh, uh, 
guidelines and procedures is critical. And we have the next group, which are the classification societies, consultants, and safety trainers. This group has a vast amount of experience that needs to be tapped on. Whilst they do compete from a competitive landscape, their collective knowledge is essential to both accelerate the identification of all the safety and operational envelopes and the establishment of regulatory and safety sandboxes that allow the first actual permit to bunker these new fuels. So when we start looking at the next level of fuel suppliers and port terminal operators, there will be requirements, especially on the terminal operators, to put in new infrastructure. Not all infrastructure can be converted depending on the molecule that's gonna be handled. So there are investment decisions that need to be made. And like every investment decision, it's a, a balance between supply and demand because the throughput and utilization of that infrastructure is gonna be critical. And I'll come to that uh, on the demand side because if you look at the end of the page, if you're looking at it it's on the right hand side, it's the cargo owners eventually who is going to put commercial pressure on the vessel operators to essentially say, I want my goods to be, to be transported on a green supply chain uh, uh, mode, right? And therefore it is in the future, what you're gonna see is there's gonna be to remain relevant, vessel operators and vessel owners need to be sensitive to the rising demand of green, either through green procurement or green citizenry that is demanding cargo owners to look for green supply chains to move their goods and services. Now, when this happens, the vessel operators then are going to look for supply chain for these uh, green molecules and the bunker suppliers who are caught in the middle between the production and the use need to then begin to look at their own assets whether they are they have to start investing in modifications but also to look at their manpower whether they are trained to handle the new molecule and if they are going to be trained are there guidelines and procedures that they can adhere and be trained around to make sure that the safe passage of this molecule does not threaten life and the community around it operates. And this therefore brings us to the last group right at the bottom. While pictorially at the bottom, the institutes of higher learning are gonna be contributing a lot of knowledge that allows us to at least make this transition in a safe manner. So, at the end of the day, when we look at alternative fuel bunkering, it is very important to realize that the safe handling of the molecule is paramount. It will determine the risk matrix, the insurance policies, the underwriters, and the ability for the regulators to feel comfortable that this molecule can be bunkered safely uh, across different stakeholders and different operating crews. And um, oh, the other thing that's going to be important is the color of the molecule. While we learn about how to transport this, at the end of the day, if we are truly going to decarbonize using ammonia or hydrogen um, or even methanol, they have to have a green footprint from a low uh, life cycle analysis. And this is going to be paramount. But until that day comes, we at least need to learn today how to handle the molecule safely and provide the users and uh, along that supply chain with the proper guidelines that will protect their workers and the community they operate in. The next page, please. So with that regard, uh, GCMD launched a call for invitation for proposal to do a study to establish both safety and operational guidelines uh, for the bunkering of ammonia. Uh, this was launched on the 8th of December and GCMD will facilitate discussions with the regulatory bodies to help achieve uh, a holistic approach towards our ability to demonstrate and pilot bunkering of ammonia in Singapore. 
there, there are quite a number of uh, packages and work streams there. But I think more importantly for all of you who are listening, who want to be involved in this project, uh, if you could go to the next page, please. They, uh, we have set up an industry consultation and alignment panel called ICAP. So we will welcome those who uh, are interested to participate and contribute to the establishment of such guidelines to scan the QR code and register your interests. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak and uh, over to you, Daniel. Thank, thank you, Sanjay, for your insightful keynote. And we look forward. Thank you, Sanjay, for your insightful keynote. And we look forward to the exciting upcoming projects and initiatives from Global Center for Marine Time Decarbonization. One of the most effective strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions is to switch from conventional fuels such as heavy fuel oil to alternative fuel. Green hydrogen is one of the promising fuel alternatives for the shipping industry and it is currently still in development stages. We have specially invited Mr. Uwe Roslin, Chairman of the Board of Hydrogen Solutions, to tell us more about this development in Norway. Hydrogen Solutions is a pure play green energy developer focusing on maritime assets with the capability to source, develop, build, and operate hydrogen plants and terminals. They aim to deploy a safe and cost-effective solutions based on proven technology and in close cooperation with industry stakeholders. Mr. Uwe Roslin has more than 30 years of experience from international shipping, shipyards, and ship equipment business. Uwe, please. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much, Daniel, for the kind introduction. <clears throat> well, today in my speech, I will shortly tell you about hydrogen solutions and our response to the hydrogen market in Norway, and particularly the government's hub strategy. So if you can take to the next page, please. Daniel. Next, next page, please. Push uh, two times. Yes. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, shortly, Hydrogen Solution is a very young company, but we have built on experience from two solid owners from the hydropower industry and gas technology in, in Norway. One of the owner, SGL, is a large Norwegian hydropower producer, which develops, builds, and operates hydropower stations they are established in 1946 and has been working with hydrogen since 2030. The other owner is Liqualine, which is an innovative gas technology company that since its inception in, 19, in 2005 has worked with turnkey deliveries for bunkering to the LNG industry has since 2018 focused on hydrogen. The company's ambition is to develop, to build, to own and operate hydrogen facilities with focus on the maritime market. Our solution enables on-site production of green hydrogen and an energy supply system based on renewable energy. Next page, please. <clears throat> In my opinion, Norway is currently a leader within green shipping. So in order to retain this position, the industry requires good test facilities to strengthen their emerging supplier industry that is working on developments in this field. In Norway, we are now building the world's first full-scale test center for new and more environmentally friendly fuels with focus on the maritime market. Here, small and large businesses alike can hire facilities to test individual components and complete systems and get help bringing products to market faster. Hydrogen Solutions and its partners will supply and own and operate a complete hydrogen plant for the test center. 
The solution is based on green hydrogen systems, pressured alkaline electrolysis, and is interconnected with the test facility for energy optimization. The startup of hydrogen production will take place in second quarter next year. And on the next page, you will see a picture of the current status of the test center and the building of the, the um, hydrogen station. The next, next play, page, please. Yeah, here you, here, we, here you will see within the red circle is the area where we now are building up the, um, the hydrogen plant for the test center. Next to it is the actual test center, which is which is shown in, in black and in gray uh, color. Next page, please. We strongly believe in local production and consumption of green hydrogen. Why? Well, because you will be able to get the cheapest end user cost and cost is of major importance in maritime industry. As you can see in this example, the distribution cost will be a significant part of the client cost. Because transporting compressed hydrogen gas by truck, railcar, ship, or barge in high pressure tube trailers is very expensive. In addition, the evaporation costs in each transmission line will be present. But there are trade-offs between centralized and distributed production to consider. Hydrogen production centrally in large plants reduces some production costs, but increases distribution costs. Hydrogen production at end use, for example, at filling and bunkering stations significantly reduces distribution costs. And this is shown in the figure to the right when we look at levelized cost of hydrogen, where electricity accounts for 65% of the costs and capex 25%. So lower price for locally produced hydrogen opens new local business opportunities and this creating values locally as well. Next page, please. <clears throat> Hydrogen Europe, the organization representing the European hydrogen industry, has clearly pointed out that ports will play a key role in the transition to the hydrogen economy. <clears throat> we at Hydrogen Solution support this and have built our strategy on this expectation. Already today, there is a large production and consumption of hydrogen in ports or close to ports. The biggest consumers come from the oil refining, ammonia and chemical industries. But this is not green hydrogen, this is gray. But gray hydrogen must be replaced with renewable or low carbon hydrogen. And this opens up an opportunity where we have a large need for hydrogen imports, makes it easier to build a clean hydrogen supply chain for international shipping. And furthermore, ports will be hydrogen hubs where hydrogen can be produced, it can be stored, consumed and distributed to many different applications. I will touch up on that on later. Uh, next page, please. <clears throat> and here, Hydromar. Hydromar is a complete and co-located hydrogen value chain for maritime use, which includes production, further processing, intermediate storage, and direct bunkering. Cutting the distribution link before bunkering while placing the plant close to the customer's sailing route makes this solution very cost effective. This terminal concept will be the first of its kind in the world with great potential to be the concept candidate in the Norwegian Maritime Hub Network. And we believe that it also has a great international potential. Hydromar is thus very well suited as a hydrogen 
hub located in strategic locations along the coast, adapted to geographical initiatives and customer specific needs, and is our response to the Norwegian government's hydrogen and hub strategy. To kickstart the hydrogen transition to ships, Hydromar will be a perfect solution for short distance ships and inland vessels. In later phases, the project would also further develop the terminal concept by developing solutions for utilization of liquid organic hydrogen and ammonia against other ship types. The terminal will thus be able to become a full-fledged energy terminal. But the road to hydrogen fuel for the maritime sector does not come without technological challenges. Safe and fast bunkering is one of the most important challenges for the use of hydrogen as a fuel. Lake Valine's long experience in LNG bunkering is important for us, together with our partners, to further develop an efficient and safe bunkering system. Safety has high focus and such terminal eliminates many of the challenges such production facilities will have if they are placed on land or close to buildings with a view to safety zones around the facility. The production of the maritime terminal can be standardized and delivered continuously to the market with the benefits that can be achieved from scale and factory production. In this context, we are working closely with one of Singapore's leading companies to build our first hydromar project in Norway. A final decision on building will be made during first quarter next year. Next page, please. <clears throat> Hydrogen is the only sufficient available and scalable technology for sector coupling meaning that in addition to hydrogen fuel for ships, the unit can supply pressured hydrogen for land transport, land-based industry, the construction industry, as well as liquid ox oxygen to other customers in ISO containers and the transfer of district heating to nearby industry and urban port areas. By using byproducts from the hydrogen value chain in the form of oxygen and waste heat, the total energy efficiency of the plant will be increased considerably. In Norway, the government had published a roadmap for hydrogen. In the short term, the ambition is to establish five hubs for hydrogen in the area of maritime transport by 2025. This in collaboration with private sector. The Norwegian government has also clarified its ambition in hydrogen by demanding zero emission from the use of batteries and hydrogen on ferries. Norled's car ferry Hydra is the world's first commercial ferry to run on liquid hydrogen. The next major project is the ferries to the Vestfjord in 2025. And already next year, there will be several projects on fast ferries in the western part of Norway. And I'm very confident that hydrogen here will play an important role in achieving zero emission goals. From the private sector, we see a strong growing interest from broad ship owners and cargo owners to use hydrogen fuel on inland routes. Several projects have been decided and many more are under development. Last page, please. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Uwe, for your insightful keynote and giving us a better picture on potential hydrogen solutions. We look forward to seeing the exciting developments of hydrogen as a maritime fuel in the coming years. Um, we shall now invite Sanjay back for the question and answer session. To the audience, um, if there's any uh, questions that you may have, please uh, feel free to raise it in the Q&A function. Uh, I shall now ask uh, Sanjay uh, a little bit more on the, uh, in the mission statement uh, that you showed earlier, there's mention of uh, 
Global Centre of Maritime Decarbonisation Financing Projects. Can you elaborate more about this and what, what is the model of uh, financing? Oh, sure, Daniel. Thank you for this opportunity. We, send, we essentially see two types of projects. One's are feasibility studies, uh, which we just launched, and we would uh, fund 100% of that project. Uh, and we will make public uh, the uh, outcomes of that project so that uh, the general maritime uh, ecosystem can benefit from it. Uh, the other type of project is when we get into pilot and demonstration, uh, we we would adopt a co-funding model for that uh, across the different players that will uh, then contribute to this pilot and demonstration. The actual percentage of the co-funding would depending would depend on the roles of the various uh, stakeholders in the consortium of the project and the potential benefits they would derive from the success of the project uh, in in the future. So it's a flexible model. The important thing is uh, we don't, on the onset, uh, other than the studies, we don't take any um, uh, IP position for funding these projects. And we just want to make sure that um, the in general, we don't take IP positions. And we just want to make sure that the project is successful, has no encumbrances to, to scale uh, and benefit the maritime sector. Thank you, Sanjay. I think that's a very useful information for the audience. Um, I would like to ask uh, over one question as well. Um, the, other than the um, safety aspects and the uh, efficiency uh, aspects, uh, what are the key obstacles for adopting hydrogen as a fuel? Well, the, the way we see it is that hydrogen is, is a perfect fuel for zero emission um, goal. Um, hydrogen is also a, a perfect fuel because you can use it today. The technology is there. Mm. Um, and, and Norway has, has proven that um, by, by Hydra, the, the world's first uh, car ferry, which is in operation. Um, so, so um, and, and, and it, it's important that, that the industry is now adapting this, um, but we also would like to, to see the hydrogen as a fuel um, kind of carrier, because hydrogen is, all, is the input variable for, for like ammonia and, and other fuels. Um, and we, we see that it, there is a longer way uh, down the road uh, in order to, to have a consensus for, for using, uh, let's say, ammonia for the world's shipping. I do hope that, that um, this consensus can, can um, uh, speed up, um, absolutely, um, particularly because a ship has a long lifetime and, and the decisions need to be taken now. Um, uh, in order to achieve these uh, these goals, that that's for sure. But basically, hydrogen is available. Technology is there. You can build inland um, domestic vessels uh, in order to to use this zero emission uh, fuel. Yeah, thank you for for the answers. And uh, I think just now you had mentioned uh, Hydra, the hydrogen fuel, the ferry. I think later on we have. Uh, Ivan from Norlet will also be sharing that with us. Um, there was a question from the floor um, that uh, many years HFO is the only fuel for shipping. Um, now LNG, hydrogen and other options are the multiple options available. Ship owners are likely to choose based on cost. Going forward, which of these options has the potential of being the main maritime fuel? I think this question I would like to um, Post to Sanjay? If I had the answer, I'll be a very rich man. Um, I think it, it, it's, you're going to find that, that in the maritime sector, you have different types of vessels. And all the fuels are going to have different volumetric energy densities. So if you compare hydrogen to heavy fuel oil, you need four times the volume of hydrogen uh, compared to heavy fuel for the same distance. So you've got to really think about the use cases where this would be easily applied. 
The other thing from Ove's slide, you'll notice that the inputs of fresh water and the inputs of renewable energy are key to make sure that the uh, hydrogen that you're making is uh, green. And uh, this is, these are two things that are not readily available across the world. Some parts of the world struggle to even have fresh water for domestic use. So I think you're gonna find a scenario where uh, there's gonna be a multi-fuel scenario uh, for, for fueling vessels for different types of uses. Uh, and uh, I, I think that even biofuels, if you can get it to scale, has an easier entry point than most of these new, new fuels like hydrogen and uh, ammonia. But we need to always consider the opportunities of, of other fuels and not just uh, think that there's going to be a one-for-one -one replacement is just because the molecules have different energy, volumetric energy density, and they have a different ability to be truly uh, uh, decarbonizing when you look at the life cycle analysis. And that's the way we should compare all these fuels. Thank you for that uh, response, Sanjay. And uh, with that, we have uh, come to the end of this uh, Q&A session. I would like to once again thank Sanjay and Uwe uh, if there are any interest in collaborating with Global Centre for Maritime Decarbonisation or with Hydrogen Solutions, please contact Innovation Norway. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will have uh, four companies from Norway and Singapore in different parts of the maritime value chain to share case studies and perspectives on decarbonisation. During their presentation, if you have any questions, please post it into the Q&A function. To start us off, we have Mr. Chong Shin Mao from Equatorial Marine Fuel Management Services. Uh, the company is a leading marine fuel logistics company in Singapore. Last year, Equatorial was ranked by Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore as the second largest bunker supplier by volume in Singapore. Equatorial currently operates a fleet of over 20 bunker tankers and supplies an annual bunker volume of 5 million metric tons. Shin Mao hits Equatorial's commercial division, as well as its decarbonization initiatives. He will be sharing useful information, as well as the company's perspective. Shimao, please. Thank you very much, Daniel. Shimon, will you be sharing your slide? Yes. Yep. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, some issues. I think. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, great. Okay, let me, sorry, give me a moment. Huh? Let me put it up first. Okay, y'all can see the screen? Okay. So, okay, distinguished guests, friends, good day to everyone. I am Shin Ma, Director of Equatorial Marine Fuel, and I will be presenting on the topic, charting a cost for the future, succeeding in the green transition. In the maritime industry, carbon emissions are largely caused by the usage of marine fuel to generate electricity, energy for ships to sail. Adoption of greener marine fuel therefore lies at the heart of the maritime industry's decarbonization efforts. Okay. Equatorial, I think has already been introduced, kindly introduced by Daniel just now. Uh, to sum up, we supply about 5 million tons of bunkers a year. Uh, which translates to about 20 operations a day and over 8,000 bunkering operations a year. So our country's, our company's actually very experienced in terms of 
carry out monthly operations, wide clientele, and we understand the needs of our customers very much. Singapore is also the largest monthly hub in the world by far. As you can see, Singapore supplied almost 15 million tons of bunkers last year, compared to the second and third, which supplied about 10 million each. So this puts Singapore in a very special position to review and to help facilitate the development of future marine fuels. Okay. It's important for us to actually understand the framework first. Under the International Maritime Organization, the initial greenhouse gas strategy is to reduce the carbon intensity of the international shipping community by at least 40% by 2030 and 70% by 2050, compared to 2008. However, this strategy will be revised next year. Therefore, a critical problem faced by the shipping industry or the broader maritime industry is actually, you know, when will what regulation kick in? Timing is essential and this will affect actually how we do our planning. At the moment, what is certain is more or less the energy efficiency index for ships and the carbon intensity index for operational, uh, how much carbon is actually em emitted in by the vessels itself. So this gives a limited certainty to ship owners because on the current basis, they can plan for the next five years what kind of ships I want to build, what kind of fuel I want to burn. But as we all know, ships are actually built to last for about 20 to 30 years. This means that if we do not have certainty beyond 2030 up to 2050, it will be actually very cost, costly uh, to ship owners if they make the wrong step, by either selecting the wrong fuel to design their ships on, or actually building the wrong ships uh, based on the wrong kind of model and wrong kind of design. As you can see, there's actually a variety of solutions available. But the question is that which solution should we adopt? And what is the effect of adopting the wrong solution? Of course, I think uh, previously as discussed at the uh, previous panel by Dr. Sanjay, it's, you know, if we knew what uh, the actual requirements are, I think it would be very, very rich indeed. These are the set of commonly uh, available or discussed marine alternate marine fuels uh, but one important point to, to take note is actually not just what is the marine fuel what is its carbon intensity but actually you know what is how is it actually created uh, at the moment uh, the marine industry actually looks at a uh, few bunk at marine fuel from perspective of a tank to to wake kind of model this means that it looks at marine fuel on how much carbon it actually produces when the marine fuel is consumed. However, I think recent literature and discussions at the international level actually places a lot of emphasis on the well-to-weight model, which you all would see changes the whole dynamics of which marine fuel to select. The well-to-weight model actually looks at how the carbon fuel, how the marine fuel itself is extracted created and then how much carbon it actually produces when consumed. So even a green fuel such as ammonia can be considered to be slightly dirty if during its production it actually produces a lot of carbon. On the other hand, a so-called dirty marine fuel such as marine gas oil can actually be considered to be carbon neutral if uh, it is, for example, produced by biomass. This gives a lot of food for thought for all of us. You know, we start to wonder, how is our power actually generated? And this is a critical issue because if we just decide based on the amount of carbon that is emitted by the marine fuel, you know, and at the end of the day, that marine fuel is available, but it is created by a high carbon process, the marine fuel might not be considered to be carbon neutral or low carbon. 
This is a projection by the IEA. At the moment, most of the marine fuel used by the shipping industry is still high carbon. Uh, even by 2030, based on the current policies announced by the various nations and international organizations, actually we're only looking at perhaps 2%, 3% of the marine fuels util being utilized as low or zero carbons. However, based on the sustainable development scenario, we expect more countries to make new announcement on how they would like to comply with their climate change obligations. And even so, by then we see perhaps up to about three to 4% of the uh, marine fuel being consumed by the shipping industry to be low or zero carbon. It's only up to when we reach 2050 that we would see a significant change. So this is a lot of uh, things for uh, ship owners and stakeholders in the maritime industry to consider. How do we get there? When do we want to plan our moves? And what things should we consider along the way as well? A potential game changer is carbon offsetting. Uh, this is quite interesting because carbon offsetting actually allows uh, us to we look at how we want to actually solve this decarbonization problem. If, for example, the shipping industry cannot come up with new technology in time, or there might be availability of fuel, but the aviation industry is able to pay a higher premium for such fuel, then can the shipping industry still you know, comply with its decarbonization obligations? Carbon credits or carbon offsetting actually gives an opportunity whereby if the marine industry stakeholders are willing to pay, perhaps they can fund other decarbonization uh, initiatives or projects in other parts of the world in a more economic and cost-effective manner. Uh, the EU has already introduced the uh, emissions trading scheme to carve to, but there's a difference between carbon credits and carbon tax. For the EU, it's about taxing ship owners. Uh, carbon credit, basically, it's uh, at the moment for shipping industry, it's more on a voluntary basis, but it's not recognized by IDD, IMO, or uh, any national or uh, regional uh, organizations. But of course, then again, this might change. So if let's say we are spending a lot of money to perhaps develop certain kind of technology, but the next day IMO steps in and say, look, we're happy to introduce a carbon tax or carbon credits, then again, it will affect the whole economics of decarbonization in the maritime industry. So how do we succeed? Uh, because, you know, we live in a so-called VUCA kind of uh, world today. Uh, it's important for us to be adaptable, flexible, find the right partners. Uh, this is where uh, companies such as Equatorial also feels that, look, if you're interested in, in developing something, uh, why not uh, approach us? Uh, we are happy to, to work together with you uh, and to find a solution with a broad base of customers. Uh, we understand ship owners very well. And I think more importantly, we understand the economics behind uh, selecting the right marine fuel. It's not just about choosing, but at the end of the day, businesses have to make sure that their business is viable. Timing is everything. You know, we feel the pulse of the market. Uh, when the LNG prices go up, you know, what are the other alternatives you can do? I think already mentioned uh, by CE of MP yesterday, uh, Singapore is looking towards a multi fuel future. Uh, therefore, at the same time, uh, how can we explore different options, hedge our risks, and also, you know, continue at the same time to, to innovate. Uh, as you can see from the presentation, there's also other bodies in Singapore, the IMO, uh, Singapore Next Gen Online Portal, the uh, Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, and the uh, Maritime uh, Energy Sustainability Development Center of Excellence. So, you know, whether it's research, uh, it's actual test baiting, or, you know, it's just about trying to find out what the availability te available technology and what other people are doing. Uh, it's quite an interesting ecosystem we have over here. And uh, one last point to note, is very importantly, uh, digitalization will form a 
key aspect of uh, decarbonization as well. If we're looking at the well to weight model, how do we know that the fuel that we receive from our supplier of today is actually carbon neutral? So it's likely that there will be a case from all the way from its extraction, there might be a tracing through blockchain technology to make sure that from extraction to creation to delivery of what the vessel, it's all being tracked that it is a so-called low carbon or carbon neutral process. Okay, with that, I end my presentation. Uh, if there's anything else more, I'm happy to answer it either offline or at the Q&A session later. Thank you. Thank you, Shinmao, for the very informative presentation. Next, we shall have TICO 2030. TICO 2030 contributes to the green transition in the maritime sector by delivering technology that helps ships to reduce their environmental and climate impacts. TICO 2030 is developing hydrogen fuel cells that enable ships and other heavy duty applications to become emissions free. Mr. Torre Anger is the founder and chairman of TICO Maritime Group. Ms. Mr. Torre Anger, please. Good afternoon, Singapore. Um, I hope that you can hear me and I think we should be very quick up and, and share the screen. So um, I hope that you can see the screen now. So we are sort of a, on a mission towards what we say zero emission. So thank you very much for, for uh, having us uh, talking about what we are doing. And um, let me just see how I can change uh, the slide. Um, Tico 2030, in brief, it's a clean tech company. We, are, we have history back in the early 90s. We have almost been 27 years uh, in operation. And we have been established in Singapore since 1995. And I think that our group of people in our office today contains about 15 people group-wise. Um, today, we are going to talk about how we can decarbonize Singapore one way or the other. And our contribution is to develop the, to make it easy. Everybody's talking about fuel cells, but if you, if you put a more human words on it so everybody understand hydrogen fuel cells is basically the engine of tomorrow and the fuel is not gasoline or diesel or heavy fuel it's hydrogen so what you can see here is a 3.2 megawatt fuel cell based in a 20 feet iso container and this is scalable Inside, inside this container, you can see eight units, which each contain 400 kilowatt of fuel cells. So 3.2 megawatt is a quite sizable uh, um, amount to get into one 20 feet container. You can have two 20 feet or you can have a 40 feet and you can have a 10 feet. This is scalable from 400 kilowatts and up to as many megawatts as required. A couple of weeks back, we finally got our approval in principle from DNV, which of course is for us uh, fantastic. It's one of the leading class society, if not the leading class of society in the world. And we are producing fuel cells for the maritime and the heavy industry. And the development is, I think, is the only fuel cells which is not coming from something on four wheels. This is industrialized from the very first second uh, on our development. We have now been working on our stack for the past 14 months. And so far we have passed more than 4,000 hours in the test bench with very, very uh, good results. Today, there is about 100,000 floating units worldwide. All of these units could be better on emission by installing fuel cells. I'm not saying that they should use fuel propulsion, but some of it. Just think about if all ships calling Singapore have a fuel cells, which means that uh, come into port, uh, zero emission, operation during the day, discharging, charging um, again, and leave 
with zero emission. That is a fantastic step towards what we are talking about in accordance with the Paris Agreement and all other stuff. So look at this, 100,000 units. And I would also like to, to mention, if you look at the deep sea shipping, which is most likely um, uh, many, many years until they will have full propulsion. But if they can come to Singapore, be in Singapore on a zero uh, emission operation, fantastic. Cruise ships, another thing. And normal cruise ships having basically four to six main engines. If you change one of them to a fuel cell, they can do the last hours in, stay the day, and do the couple of first hours out again on sort of a zero emission operation. And then you have all the fast ferries, the work boats, not to mention the river and the waterways. We are heavily involved in a project, which I will talk about a little bit later. Here is basically the fuel cell development. And here is who we are dealing with and using together as industry leaders. We have also recently went into an agreement with Keppel in Singapore. So we can also talk about that later. And we are the first large scale production of hydrogen fuel cells. Here is our factory in the northern part of Norway, where will we be able to uh, have a production up to 1.2 gigawatt when we are coming to 2030. In 2024, we should be able to produce roughly 120 megawatts of fuel cells which will increase to 400 already in 2025. And then you can ask, are we, are we lined up with what's happening in the industry? Yes, I think so. Because the value chain have to go hand in hand here. You have to do this together. Somebody have to produce the hydrogen. Somebody have to make sure that the hydrogen is coming to where people need it. And so, so, so the, the timeline, I think is, I think is, uh, we are, I think we are very, very on. We have a supply frame agreement signed with Chemgas, which is a huge operator of ships on the waterways in Europe. And one of the biggest hydrogen projects in Europe at the moment is what we call green hydrogen at the Blue Danube. 80,000 tons of green hydrogen is going to be produced in Romania by Wind and Sun and be freighted by Chemgas, which will be then having fuel cells from us on the tugboats and on the barges up through Donau into the industry heart of Austria and, and, uh, and Germany. And you can see there's big players involved here. You have Verbun, you have Siemens, Hydrogenius, Gunvor, Bosch, AVL, which I will come back to, and of course Chemdas. So here we are talking about six, up to 60 new tugs and 80 to 100, maybe even 120 barges, which needs fuel cells. So the riverways, the short sea shipping, port operation will be the first one to, to do this. Here we have another guy who is extremely keen on getting into all the nicest places in the world. There is about 32, 33 million people cruising in the world on a yearly basis. In Norway now, when we are getting to 2026, there is zero emission into the heritage fjords. That means that the ship have to stay outside or they have to find some way to get into, in particular, the two most famous fjords in Norway on a zero emission. As I mentioned earlier, six main engine, replace one of them with a fuel cell and you can go in the fjord, you can stay the day, and you can leave again on a zero emission. Why do we think that we are going to be very successful? We are cooperating with AVL in Austria, which is the largest independent company in powertrain development since the past 70 years. AVL is producing, not producing, developing, engine, they have done more than 1,500 engine designs, 11,000 people is employed worldwide, and they are our partner in the fuel cell development.
already carried out more than 300 projects. They have 18, 19 years of experience from the fuel cell industry. And the test rig system in Graz in Austria is the biggest in the world. And we are ready to install our first test units in the beginning of 2023. These pilots are already airmarked, so we are uh, waiting for new ones to come. But this is where we are for the moment. And if you ask me, there will be a lot of roads to take to make the world a better place to do. There is space for everybody. And um, I think that if we are going to change the world, a lot of companies have to stay shoulder by shoulder and move that huge mountain together. We have a very, very experienced team. I'm not going to uh, jump into each of them, but all of these guys is having a lot of experience from the field we are into, including shipping, financing, developing fuel cell, and so on and so on. And of course, we are also following strict uh, when it comes to the ESG and the project plan. And we feel that we are. Um, we are ready to be a part of the transition. And we really hope that when we are in 2030, maybe 2040 as well, we can sit back and relax and, and say that thank, we are very pleased that we was a part of this transition and still are and still will be. Because this is, of course, not finished next year. Keep in mind that um, energy mix in 2050 will still contain all almost 45% of fossil fuels. So there is a lot to do out there. So I think that was uh, what I would like to share with you. So if there is any prompt question, I'm here. So um, please. Thank you, Tori, for the exciting presentation. And we are very, it's very exciting to see the developments of hydrogen uh, fuel cells. Next, we shall have uh, Norlet. Norlet is one of Norway's largest ferry and express boat operators. The company has 80 vessels and operates ferry and express boat services. Mr. Ivan Osvik is the project manager for developing and building the world's first hydrogen-driven car ferry, Hydra, where he also develops hydrogen-driven high-speed passenger ferries. Ivan, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Ivan Ostrik from Norway. There, I, I was. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. So we um, in Norway, we uh, we are, uh, yeah, doing our part to to contribute to this technology shift and the, the climate change. We uh, I'm, I've been project manager for uh, developing, designing, and constructing uh, hydro in Norwegian ferry. Uh, which uh, will be the first to run on liquid hydrogen in the, in the world uh, when we have it in operation in, uh, say, early in June, winter and June and spring. Just uh, no lead uh, as such, we are a ferry and high-speed uh, operator, high-speed passenger ferry operator in Norway with around 80 ships in total. Uh, so one, uh, one of the largest operators in Norway. Uh, just to... I'll give a little bit of a background on the uh, fuel transition that is happening here in Norway. Uh, so, sorry, Ivan. Uh, we are not able to see your slides. You, you may have to reshare it again. Okay, sorry. Right. I lost the control here. Basically. Uh, if not, the alternative is we can share it on our end and uh, you just let us know uh, when you want to move the slides. Uh, yes, uh, can you? Yep, okay, now we're sharing it. Yep, yes, thank ahead. you. Yeah, I, I lost the control. Basically, everything went black. Yeah, if you go, just go to slide two, please. Um, this is yeah, just this is just showing uh, knowledge um, uh, 
the field of business. We're operating car ferries and fast passenger ferries in, in Norway. And next slide, please. And, and just a, a brief background on the fuel, fuel transition that this has happened here in Norway. Uh, from uh, 2015, we started with battery-driven ferries uh, with, with the Ampere. And, and this transition uh, has uh, resulted in now, next year, there will be around 80 electrical-driven ferries in Norway. And then also from, uh, from next year on, uh, Hydra will be in operation on, on hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please. So the, uh, the, the ferry hydra has been a lot of uh, focus on this. Uh, it's a sizable uh, ship. It carries 80 car, uh, or car units, uh, around 300 passengers. And uh, notably, we will have a four-tone uh, uh, capacity tank to, to carry liquid hydrogen on board. And we, we have installed uh, two modules, uh, each 200 kilowatts, so we 400 kilowatt of uh, pen fuel cells on board. And it, it also carries uh, 1.5 megawatt hours of batteries. So this, uh, this ferry uh, was part of a tender competition from the Norwegian Road Administration here in Norway. Uh, Norway won the tender and the, this ferry is now in operation on batteries. During the winter, we will install the hydrogen system and put it in uh, operation in the in the say in the during the spring we we, we clearly we clearly see that uh, uh, like this uh, when this this is the first ship that will run on liquid hydrogen it, it, it's one of the first ships that will run on hydrogen at all using PEM cells there are two or three other projects upcoming now this uh, autumn, this winter, this spring. Uh, and uh, the question we ask ourselves in, in Norland is, uh, okay, how, how will we go on from here? Because we, uh, we don't have any hydrogen production in Norway. We will get uh, liquid hydrogen from Germany uh, carried on trucks. So, so uh, it's uh, it's it's not easy for us to be a ferry operator and high high speed passenger operator, and then going to new tenders now where they ask for hydrogen. We we will have no control of the supply chain. Uh, what we do control is that we know that we can run these ships on uh, hydrogen. We we are getting all the licenses and all the certificates in place now before we install it uh, starting here in the winter. So uh, it's it's uh, it's a matter of the fact that uh, the, the issue has been uh, targeted early on in this presentation on the, the bunkering and the supply chains is 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 the key aspects now and to, to really see this fuel tra transition taking place. So if you go to the next slide, please, because there, there's a, a lot of uh, projects now uh, upcoming here in in Norway and, and in Europe. We, we see that uh, uh, inland barges as uh, Tour and from Tech 2030 total bought many projects. I think future proof shipping would be the first one with, with, the, with the barge on the, on the River Seine. And um, in, in, in Asia uh, and towards Japan, we see uh, tra transport, transport vessels for liquid hydrogen being developed. And as you see in the slide now, from now on, or from, from say from next year on, there will be a number of uh, applications in, in the shipping sector. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, please. So uh, touching upon this, uh, in the, uh, in all, uh, we were really encouraging the maritime uh, hydrogen supply chain to, to come in place. Uh, this is a huge topic in, in Norway. There are now uh, national programs where, we, where they're trying to develop uh, maritime hubs. Uh, I assume Singapore will be a similar maritime hub uh, in, in the Asia region. Uh, but it's, it's really needed to, to have a, some coordinated action on this. And, and not at least where will we get the power from to, to produce hydrogen? It's a, it's a huge question. Uh, I, I listed up offshore wind. Uh, uh, on my slide here, and and I believe that uh, 
such uh, industries like offshore wind will see a, a huge influence in how to develop the the energy needed for this fuel transition to take place. And, and of course, uh, hydrogen, we, in Norway, we're focusing on, uh, on uh, say, the pure hydrogen, it be it compressed or liquid. But of course, for the big shipping and deep sea shipping, uh, there, there seems to be a focus on ammonia. But again, green ammonia needs green hydrogen. Uh, and then there's a talk about uh, and get the hydrogen from, from natural gas and so on. So, uh, as, as uh, in the debate earlier today, we don't really have answers to this question, where, where is all this energy needed uh, to, for, for shipping to go green coming from? It's, I think you will see a, a diversification where you have a localized production for the smaller ships and maybe more global um, uh, global distribution of ammonia for, for, for deep sea shipping. And, uh, and I think the diversification you see, you see that in the DNV report, that there's a whole range of different fuels that will be applied in, in the years to come. And then, of course, if you go to the cost issue, we uh, hydrogen is today much more expensive than uh, diesel. It's uh, maybe comparable with biofuels and biodiesel that we are, we are working with. But uh, in, in order for us to really to take the shift here in Norway, what we talk about is uh, like it's something we call contract for difference that will cover the gap between diesel and, for example, liquid uh, hydrogen. So this will be a national instrument that can uh, enable ship owners to say, okay, let's go for, for, for hydrogen for, for this ship and, or this route or this shipping segment. But it's, it's needed some kind of support to really enable the shift. Until uh, the CO2 tax has been added to, to diesel and, uh, and heavy fuel oils. Um, and in Europe, we talk about the CO2 tax around 200 euros in, in the end or towards 2030. And, and with that kind of taxation on top of uh, marine diesel oil, uh, hydrogen uh, would be the, the uh, best economic solution for us. I think the tipping point uh, studies from Hydrogen Europe is showing that the, if the CO2 tax is around 150 euros, um, hydrogen will be uh, cost competitive to, to marine diesel. So, so it will be exciting to see coming to 2030 what, what the, uh, how this uh, see, will result in. But we are preparing, we are preparing that hydrogen will become the cheaper fuel. So, so that's why we have been doing this project with hydrogen and also high, high speed passenger boats that we're working with. And, and then thirdly on this slide, the ship technology, this, we, we are solving this. There, there are a number of uh, fuel cell suppliers coming in, uh, onto the stage. We have uh, combustion engines that have been prepared for hydrogen. Uh, so, so these two will live together uh, in order to, to uh, propel the ship. Uh, we see that the, the tank suppliers for, for liquid and compressed hydrogen uh, all are shaping up. There are now, uh, since we started hydrogen, there were hardly any tank suppliers that uh, knew what we were asking about. But now there are three or four major players that we, we can use for, for liquid hydrogen uh, and similar for compressed uh, solutions. So, uh, and also for the, uh, my last point on this slide, for, for a number of years, we will uh, need to do a risk-based design. We, we need to prove that uh, everything we do is safe, be it ammonia or, or liquid or compressed hydrogen. You really need to show the dimensioning uh, risk scenarios and, and have us provide uh, equivalent safety uh, toward, towards the passengers or, or cargo that we're carrying. But this, this has been tackled now, uh, now that we are going through this alternative design now, we have the, uh, the, the handbook for, for this internally, we are getting through. So, so this is, um, and then for project number two and three and then 20, this will be a kind of a more easy thing to do. So by, if you go to the next slide, I will just say thank you for, 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 for listening and, uh, and I'm uh, open for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for the excellent presentation. Last but not the least, we have Yara International. 
Yara International is the world's leading fertilizer company and a provider of environmental solutions. Lisa Winter is SVP of Projects and Technology in the Yara Clean Ammonia Division, where she is responsible for the development of the project portfolio of green and blue ammonia projects, as well as the R&D activities in Yara Clean Ammonia. Lisa, please. Thank you. Um, I will just try to screen, uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Perfect. Yes, uh, thanks uh, Daniel and, uh, for, for having the opportunity to present uh, Yara and Yara Clean Ammonia at the, uh, this um, uh, Singapore Norway Innovation Conference. And uh, first I would just give a very brief uh, introduction of what Yara is because uh, because maybe maybe you're not, yeah, that, that's a, a bit of a a different, uh, different segment that uh, compared to shipping, but Yara is a leading fertilizer company uh, and a provider of environmental solutions, where we have around 16,000 employees worldwide and are present in 160 countries. So the question is then, why are we here today? What is the link between the fertilizer and, and what we're going to talk about here? And, and the fact is that uh, to make fertilizer, you need to make ammonia first. And, and uh, by being a, a large fertilizer company, we, we ha have then a large ammonia asset base and is also the world leading trader of ammonia with approximately 20% of the world market. And uh, Yara established this February, uh, Yara, the Yara Clean Ammonia segment to focus on enabling the green hydrogen, green and blue hydrogen economy. And then, so why, why are we looking at ammonia? And, um, and uh, so uh, what we see is that ammonia is probably the most suitable zero carbon fuel for the maritime sector especially when we're talking about deep sea shipping. Because if you look at the ammonia and, the, the, uh, the, um, and, and, and compare it with, for instance, hydrogen, ammonia, it's, it's, uh, it's more energy in a bucket of ammonia than it is in a bucket of hydrogen. And it's also easier to transport. Uh, we, we can transport ammonia and it is transported today across the across uh, across the globe, and we, we then we uh, transport it with only you see going down to minus 30, 33 degrees C. So so that is one element why we believe that uh, that ammonia is the is the most suitable uh, zero carbon fuel. But uh, it's uh, it's it's also uh, due to the, the much you see, higher temperature that you can, can transport it uh, to, then it's, it's also easier to transport. And, and it's, also, it's also attractive as an energy carrier uh, because it takes less volume, but it also can substitute, for instance, coal in, in power plants. So we believe that, uh, that ammonia can be a, an enabler both for the hydrogen economy and also for, for the green shift. And, and uh, the utilization of the existing infrastructure because ammonia is produced today. It produced uh, 200 million tons uh, of ammonia across the globe today. And by, but it's today produced with uh, natural gas. And, uh, but, but by utilization of the existing infrastructure, then we can, can uh, retrofit. And that would be the, probably the most cost efficient way to early enable the hydrogen market before, before new capacity is coming on stream. And today, as I mentioned, we're producing it uh, by, from natural gas through steam, methane reforming, then we get the hydrogen. 
and then uh, we combine it then with nitrogen and then we are getting ammonia through the harbor bosch process and by retrofitting for instance replacing the uh, natural gas with uh, water and electrolysis we can produce green green ammonia or we can still use the natural gas and then we can uh, we already capture approximately 70 percent of the the CO2 that is emitted through the SMR and the Harbour Bosch process. And so we can then uh, store and uh, transport and store the CO2 and then uh, have blue ammonia. And for green new or for, for new capacity, then you can install, in, you can replace a standard SMR process you can replace that with something called AGR and then you actually can then actually more 90 to 95 percent of the CO2 is already captured so then it would be more easy for for um, for transport and storage of the CO2 and and then produce blue ammonia I have included a figure just to show the, the carbon footprint of, of uh, ammonia versus uh, other fuels. And, and uh, as you see here, uh, using grey ammonia today, if you're using the well, uh, well to, to tank or, or tank to propeller, then, then uh, grey ammonia has quite a high CO2 emissions. But when, when, if you're going to to green or blue, you see both ammonia and hydrogen is, is having a huge reduction. There is still some, some somewhat left, but but uh, it's it's really a competitive fuel related to the CO2 footprint. So then uh, you can say then by by uh, the um, having the target of 40%, 50% reduction by 2050 you need to, to uh, really get the, uh, the the reduction quite significantly but uh, of course there will still be vessels out there going with uh, heavy fuel or, or LNG or, or fossil fuel uh, but if you then go further to to, um, to uh, you see the forecasting of, of how how the uh, development will go related to uh, to marine fuel then then um, you see that the, with the shipping sector if you then aiming to decarbonize ammonia is then forecasted to emerge as the most notable contributor for zero carbon fuel where lng is seen as an interim solution with limited investments after maybe 2030 ammonia will replace fossil fuel together with hydrogen and methanol but the, here you also see that it's it's a bit with the with the benefit of ammonia having taking less volumes compared to for instance hydrogen it is foreseen there that ammonia will take a larger proportion of the market compared to uh, compared to hydrogen that's mainly due to the on longer distance and then, uh, and then, uh, then we see also the the, uh, the increased demand for ammonia. So we see more than a you can see that more than a doubling of today's capacity. Uh, but the good thing is that we already have a capacity in the market today, so we can start because it's testing out the uh, the uh, ammonia on the technical side that you can test out the uh, engines the uh, the and and develop and green because uh, it is existing so you can use it and then and then we have a, a gradual the shift towards uh, towards um, green and blue ammonia converting them from from gray so because where is yara in this picture and uh, Yara, Yara's position is quite unique because we, we have a, a leading position both on production but also on, on trading and distribution. And uh, we have uh, 
already we are producing eight and a half million tons across the, the 17 uh, units and uh, and all those the, those production units are not too far away from potential bunkering hubs uh, we have production in in the netherlands close to so, so rotterdam is not too far away we have production in in the um, in northwest uh, australia uh, and then we also have production in in us and um, and trinidad that can also support the the, uh, the american um, american uh, area so so uh, and, and in addition to that we have already because we worked on trans uh, or, or um, rep uh, retrofitting our plants so we will have uh, we have a uh, green pilots scheduled for startup already in uh, in 2023 and we also have some blue uh, project under development so uh, so we are not only having the gray ammonia that we have today but we also are in the transition to produce both green and um, and blue ammonia and um, we also we also are transporting ammonia today uh, we have uh, not not uh, we have 11 ships transporting uh, globally so we have then the possibility to combine our production assets with the our trading and uh, shipping uh, shipping um, no, uh, assets and um, uh, if I just take the last one we are also we don't experience in handling ammonia the last I would say seven decades. We also participate now in in several joint industry projects to develop the the value chain from where we are today to do the to bunkering and also uh, and also uh, to the uh, to use of ammonia on board vessels, both uh, on uh, fuel cells going directly on uh, ammonia. But also on uh, on the, for instance, the Castor initiative related to develop bunkering terminals for ammonia. And uh, I will just um, finish off that uh, with saying that the world needs a clean energy transition, and our Yara Clean Ammonia will uh, create a clean energy future in, for instance, shipping. Thanks for the attention. And if there is any questions, then I'm here. Thank you, Lisa, for the very interesting presentation and for also showing us the possibilities of green ammonia marine fuel. We shall now invite the rest of the speakers back for a time of question and answer. And um, I think we have a, a question from the floor from Yuan Paul. I think it's directed to Ivan Osvik. Um, the shipping segment that you operate is in is ideally suited for electrical storage systems, batteries. Even with fuel cells which produce electricity, the propellers are driven by electric motors. For hydrogen production, you need electricity in the first place. So why not use electricity battery power directly on board the vessels? Yeah, yes, we, uh, when we can, uh, we use battery driven uh, vessels, ferries and high speed boats. Um, for for this first project, Hydron, this is a pilot demonstration project where the uh, tender requirements are uh, instructed us to use uh, hydrogen as fuel, and where the requirement uh, is that at least fifty percent of the annual energy consumption shall be coming from uh, um, hydrogen uh, fuel cells. So, and for this particular route that uh, Hydron is working on. Um, Yes, we, we can say that 100% on, uh, on batteries, no problem. Uh, and that's uh, by far the cheapest. But th this is a pilot project uh, demonstration. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the answer. I hope it addresses the question. Uh, is there any other further questions from the floor? 
if if not, um, I have a question for um, uh, Tico twenty thirty Tori. Um, just now you mentioned that that the there's a, your company has this tagline: hydrogen fuel cells are the engines of tomorrow. Uh, I'd just like to check if you how's the performance of hydrogen fuel cells compared to uh, traditional fuel engines. Uh, can you please repeat? Yep, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you, how is the performance of hydrogen fuel cells compared to traditional fuel engines? On the PEM side, it's slightly higher, and on the SOF side, it's much higher. Okay, thanks, thanks for the um, uh, clarification. Uh, and we have another question from uh, Tom. Um, it's not a, really a question, but a comment. He, I think he's talking about advanced battery developments ongoing could change the hybrid equation. Uh, anyone has any uh, comments to add to that? Maybe Ivan could uh, uh, share uh, your thoughts on this. Yes, the, uh, we, uh, I mentioned we just read in the question. The, um, this, is, this is interesting because we, we see that the battery technology is improving. Uh, but it, it um, it's not believed that battery technology will be able to to take the long uh, the long deep sea shipping at least uh, uh, ever. So the, the question is for us in all that how much should we invest in battery technology and and battery research? Uh, <clears throat> because we see that the hydrogen cost is coming down and. Uh, just to compare with, with hydro, if we if, if I fully charge hydro with, with our current battery capacity, we, we can increase it a little bit for space and so on. But if you fully charge it and we run on batteries alone um, without charging them, we be uh, I can say like three hours. If I fully load my my hydrogen tank and run on fuel cells alone, I can say twelve days. So the difference is 12 days, three hours. And that really gives the picture of the, the, say the, the, energy, uh, the energy potential in hydrogen compared to batteries. So that's the current gap. Of course, batteries will improve, but then again, hydrogen will also, fuel cells will also improve. So, so it's, it's not an easy, easy question, but in any case, for the next decade, NOLED will, uh, if we have hydrogen and fuel cells, we will have a lot of batteries to balance the fuel cells and to operate it uh, maybe with 80% fuel cells, 20% batteries. So, so the hybridization here is, is, is key to, to get this to run uh, in, a, in a good manner. Thanks. Um, at this point, we have also another question from Srinath. I think this will be more directed to Lisa which is uh, how do you deal with the challenges with ammonia leakages in terms of safety? You can say that um, uh, what, what they're looking into now is the, that uh, use of the same system design as you have used for, for LNG. And, uh, and that, so in, in that way, you can handle the, with the double piping, pipe in pipe systems, that, they, uh, that that would be uh, sufficient to, so to handle the, the um, the issues with the, the toxicity of, of ammonia because uh, we know that uh, that's an issue, but that uh, but it will handle the same way as you handle uh, LNG uh, or uh, yeah other you see, um, uh, explosive uh, or like yeah, yeah gases fossil fuel. Yep. Yeah, thank you for the uh, answer. Um, I think that uh, we have uh, run out of time uh, at this point. Uh, we are excited to see both Singapore and Norwegian companies taking active steps in developing solution and technology for maritime decarbonization. Again, if you have any interest to partner or work with any of these companies, please feel free to contact Innovation Norway. So thank you to all for your presentations. Uh, really enjoyed the presentations. And finally, to wrap up, and conclude today's program, we shall have my esteemed colleague, Mr. Per Christel Lund, Science and Technology Councillor, okay. Innovation Norway, to give us the closing remarks. Per Christel, please. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, I have the pleasure now to summarize this very interesting session of the 
Singapore Norway Innovation Conference or, or SNIC. Uh, for those of you that joined uh, yesterday's SNIC event, uh, you noticed that the Minister of State, uh, Chi Hong Tat, in his opening address, and also the Chief Executive of NPA, the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, Kui Li Hun, highlighted the most, two most important drivers to establish the future sustainability maritime sector. It's digitalization and decarbonization. Today, we followed up by diving into these two aspects of the maritime sector. Thomas Ting of MPA, he started and stated that the maritime sector needs innovation as the engine for transformation and growth, and showed that MPA builds an enabling environment for innovation through industry consortia, international collaboration, and startup ecosystems like the Pier 71. Thomas also mentioned the close cooperation between Norway and Singapore on research and innovation, such as the MOU between the uh, Norwegian Research Council and also the co-creation of solutions through processes like the Norway Maritime Innovation Process Workshop earlier this year. Jon Leon Ervik uh, of the Norwegian Coastal Administration also confirmed and presented an impressive list of examples of the long and fruitful history of cooperation between Singapore and Norway on maritime digitalization, vessel communication systems and autonomy. He noted that going forward, important cooperation topics include port and harbor traffic control, route information and optimization, and on multimodal transport and efficient port operations. So my colleague Daniel, uh, you masterly moderated the panel discussion on digitalization and maritime communication, where we heard about the recent development opportunities on VDES, uh, 5G and satellite solutions from, for example, Nakul Malholtra of Willems and Ship Services, we talked about data as the new oil, reflecting on the important aspects of data generation, data ownership, data accessibility, data management, and not at least data use and refinement. So he pointed out that the role of the various institutional facilities, such as regulator and sandbox providers to push innovation, is essential in this value chain. Uh, Dr. Francois Chin of ASTAR uh, talked about their research on uh, VDES, the VHS data exchange systems, especially on the challenges like communication bandwidth and signal range uh, capacities in highly trafficked port and harbor environment. This was also mentioned uh, by Thomas as one of the major problems moving towards uh, utilization of 5G in, in the maritime sector. Hans Christian Haugli from Space Norway explained the VDES as a two-way communication standard. To reuse uh, John Leon's uh, phrase, VDES is the postman that has two communication routes, uh, the conventional uh, VHS ship to shore and through satellite, which both have their benefits and challenges. He gave examples of the huge potential for new application uh, that high reliability and capacity satellites VDES can offer in safety, surveillance and monitoring, route optimization, vessel IoT, etc. Finally, Peter Schellenberger of Tormer Ship Management, which is one of the leading ship owner, operator and service company uh, located here in Singapore, talked about how extended communication and data management capabilities and also new concepts such as drones are effectively deployed and accepted in his organization. Uh, we, uh, met a, uh, we, we met a sample of frontier technologies from a good selection of uh, Singaporean and Norwegian companies. Nicholas Angs of F-Drones operates uh, drones for commercial delivery of goods to vessels. And hopefully within a few years, it will, we will see their hyper-launched heavy drone uh, being able to deliver 100 kilograms, 100 kilograms of payload over 100 kilometer range. Peter Nielsen of AOS Offshore uh, talked about simultaneous subsea and aerial drone operations and the data platform and advanced control system that will enable this. They're also working on a 400 kilogram payload drone and firefighting and precision delivery robots. Vega Hofstein, Maritime Robotics, presented their Otter and their Mariners. their are two unmined, surf unmanned surface vessels, an example of their application areas such as hydrography, seismic exploration, seabed mapping, military and R&D. Kunyang of Super Radio presented their project on 5G based massive MI, MI communication in maritime environments. And Bjorn Costa of uh, uh, Kongsberg No Control finally presented their solution for VDES and 5G uh, utilizing satellite communication infrastructure. 
Uh, Bjorn also uh, listed some applications relevant for Singapore, including the Sesame 2 uh, project. And of course, their next generation national traffic management system here in Singapore. Moving over to the second topic of today, uh, maritime decarbonization. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Kuttam of the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization set the arena or the, or the platform for defining their center's mission statement, which I believe also applies for the industry as such. To eliminate greenhouse gas emissions through national and international standards, to develop and deploy solutions, to mobilize green financing, and to foster cross-sector, and I would add, international collaboration. In addition to drawing the map of the necessary ecosystem required for green bunkering infrastructure, Sanjay also presented their call for proposal for an ammonia bunkering safety and operational guideline study, and the invitation to join their industry consultation and alignment panel. Hope that many of the audience today are, are, uh, are taking that opportunity. Uwe Hörslan from Hydrogen Solution is uh, very optimistic that green hydrogen solution will play an important role in the decarbonization of the maritime sector, exemplified by their Hydromart project. Uwe also stressed the importance of large ports such as Singapore as hydrogen hub and facilitator of the hydrogen value chain. We got uh, a few commercial cases from Norway and Singapore on the green fuels, including uh, Chongqing Mao of the Equatorial Marine Fuel Management System, talk about their alternative view of the life cycle for fuels, green fuels, from the conventional tank to wake to the more holistic well to wake, also including green fuel sourcing and carbon reduction schemes. Touring uh, proposed and, uh, and demonstrated how TECO 3030s and their technology can contribute to decarbonize Singapore's maritime and heavy duty industry using their containerized hydrogen and fuel solutions, fuel cell solutions. Even a streak of the Norwegian transport company Norled presented where we are, Norway is standing, on the fuel transportation in Norway from the first L ferry Ampere in 2015 to around 80 electrical ferries on the waters from next year or and years beyond, and the launch of the first hydrogen fuel ferry Hydra from next year. Ivan also gave a very compact and very good overview of the barriers to adoption of the hydrogen of hydrogen as a maritime bunker. Finally, Lisa Wint of Java uh, presented their business case for green ammonia as maritime bunker and, the, and their role as a major a global major supplier of green, uh, green ammonia for maritime and other industry sectors. So to round off the impression of those two days uh, of the SNCC is an increasing sense of urgency to fully understand and acknowledge the global climate change challenges and the measures necessary to decarbonize the shipping and maritime industry. But the discussions today and the presentations of innovation and technology also confirms there is much optimism and confidence that we together will find solutions to meet the industry targets for sustainability and decarbonization. The SNCC and other meeting arenas like the Norway Singapore Science Week are a platform for us to come together, hopefully more physical in the future, to explore research cooperation, joint innovation and technology development, and to, de and to deploy uh, commercial solutions. I would like to mention that the Norway Singapore Science Week starts November 1st for a week, concluding with a special webinar on Friday, November 5th on maritime electrification that is a complement to today's seminar and should be of interest for many of the audience today. We will keep you updated on the program and the registration for this event. With this, I'd like to thank the organizer of, the, uh, of these events, the Norwegian Business Association, my colleagues at Innovation Norway, especially Daniel, and the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Singapore, and at not at least the speakers, moderators, and panelists for a successful webinar today. So thank you and goodbye, and hope to see many of you again at the Norway Singapore Science Week in about a week and a half's time. Thank you. <laughs>